country. Um, and our first speaker uh, is going to be welcoming us, Dorothy um, Kidd, who's the, with the Media Studies Department here at uh, University of San Francisco. And actually, is she here? She just left the room for a few minutes. She'll be right. She left a few. Okay, she'll be here uh, back in a few minutes. So what we're going to be doing this morning is we're going to be having a number of presentations uh, from here and around the world about the issue of uh, what we have to do and what is being done. And this will include, we're going to be starting off with uh, Martin Jansen, who is with Workers World Production in South Africa, Cape Town, who is working on the development of a labor channel. Uh, we're going to be having Richard Stallman, uh, from Brazil who's going to be talking about the issue of free software and also the right to communicate, particularly in the situation with uh, WikiLeaks and Bradley Manning and uh, what that means as far as communication technology. And also we're going to have a report on the struggle of the Walmart workers uh, and they're here today so I'm going to give them a hand right off the bat. You know. I think that was a, an important experience for working people about uh, use of technology, use of online technology and other communication tools to build solidarity and to link up workers around the world as well as in this country. And uh, it's no accident that uh, we had a disaster in uh, Bangladesh uh, with the Bangladeshi workers who were actually producing Walmart clothes and they faced similar attacks on their conditions and um, the right to uh, health and safety uh, workplace and that's a very important issue for us because health and safety is a critical question for all working people in the United States whether they be Walmart workers, longshoremen, any workers face an attack on their health and safety conditions. So uh, joining us this morning um, and welcoming us to the University of San Francisco is Dorothy Kidd and she's one of the uh, supporters of Labor Tech and uh, is involved in media communications and democracy. So, uh, without further ado, let me welcome Dorothy Kidd. Well, that's a lovely formal introduction. I think everybody was here last night, so. Um, welcome you all to the University of San Francisco. Uh, this conference is an ongoing conference. I think this is the fifth time we've had it here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, to, to bring it here. It's an unusual conference. Not only is it local, but, but international. Steve does an incredible effort in uh, bringing in people from around the world and more recently being able to do that by, by Skype and other kinds of means. Uh, the conference also combines uh, not only critical analysis of what's happening to, to workers around the world, uh, but how technology is both aiding and uh, abet abetting workers, um, not only uh, limit or increasing the workload and speeding up our work everywhere, but also um, uh, providing the technologies uh, with which workers are, are fighting back and resisting and trying to make a better world. Um, I also think that Labor Tech is exemplary in providing uh, tech workshops so that we can also become part of that uh, worldwide movement to use technology for, for humans and not for corporate profits. So, um, this long program. Uh, I want to again thank you very much um, and have a wonderful conference. So, uh, thank you, Dorothy, and it's through uh, her work that we're really having, able to have a conference here at USF. So, uh, one of the issues uh, that we're addressing is what is going on with workers' communication worldwide and what tasks, what do we have to do to organize to build international solidarity. There's struggles, of course, of workers around the world, uh, including the longshoremen who are now uh, on strike in Los Angeles, have shut down the largest uh, container port in the United States, but there's struggles going on throughout the world of workers. And one of the uh, strategies and perspectives of work is to how to build that to build an international labor channel. So joining us uh, from Cape Town, South Africa is Martin Jansen and he's with uh, Workers World Media Productions in Cape Town and has been a leading advocate and exponent of the need for a labor channel and for labor media. So welcome Martin Jansen. Welcome Martin. Can you 
again, stop. Okay, yeah, I hear, but the sound is not connected to the speaker. Hold on a second. Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh, okay, I got it. No, I got it. It's not. Okay, one, okay. Try that back. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay, we got you. Okay, we can hear you. Hold on. Okay, thank you, Martin. You're on. Okay, thank you, Steve, and thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, I just want to. Sorry, there's a bit of an echo, but anyway. Yeah, I just want to talk about something we initiated in 2006. We had an international workshop in. Cape Town, and the idea was to explore developing an international labor media network. And the idea behind this was to get together a network of labor media practitioners like yourselves all over the world.
watched any, uh, or read any articles or watched the news and saw the Walmart strikes, was it last week? It feels like it was like a lifetime ago, it was last week. So, um, so pretty much, I, I'm assuming that everyone has a pretty basic awareness of, of what happened. Um, but so, so my name's Andrea Dellendorf. I am the, um, one of the assistant directors to the Making Change at Walmart campaign. And specifically, my role is I've been overseeing the development of and the building of the organization United for Respect at Walmart, which is a national organization of Walmart associates who are coming together to make change in their workplaces, uh, connect with each other, and to raise the issues of how Walmart workers are being treated. Uh, in their stores, and you know the strike that we that just happened last week was the culmination of uh, about a year and a half of organizing. In June of last year, a hundred Walmart workers got together in Bentonville, Arkansas, which is where Walmart's headquarters are, and had our first uh, first real organizing committee meeting where we founded and launched the organization United for Respect at Walmart with a hundred leaders from around the country. Uh, and it was just truly an amazing experience because as you can imagine, organizing Walmart is a daunting task. There's 1.4 million Walmart workers in the United States. Like just fathom how on earth you organize that, right? Um, and so, and we had operations, uh, real field operations in about eight different cities where we had union members from the United Food and Commercial Workers Union who were out on leave from their jobs, going door to door, talking to Walmart workers, inviting them to be a part of the organization. Uh, and we had a, so we really found some good leaders, found some activists, but we really wanted to bring people to get together to connect around the country. So everybody came together, 100 people. We drafted a, or the workers drafted a, what we call our Declaration for Respect, which is all of the things that our Walmart stands for, better wages, health insurance, um, no, no discrimination at work, all, all the kind of things we know about and support as union uh, organizers and leaders, um, and made a commitment to start fighting. In January of that year, uh, we had another committee meeting uh, with the national group, and folks, we started talking about what is it really, what are we gonna do, and what are we gonna have to do to really bring Walmart to the table? And there was a great discussion. We had, we had actually, the meeting was in December. It was right after Black Friday of last year. We all know the insanity of Black Friday, right? People are killed, shot, you know, beaten up, you know, trampled with the, this huge consumer frenzy. And so we were talking about what are we gonna do, what do we have to do to change this? And it was a great discussion because one of our leaders stood up and said, well, we just need to strike and we need to strike on Christmas. So let's get ready now to strike on Christmas. And another leader said, well, wait a second, people aren't ready to strike yet. They're, you know, they're not gonna do that, we can't do that. And then some, another leader, who she liberated from Los Angeles said, well, the question is, if we're not ready to do it now, what do we need to do to be ready to do it next Black Friday? And from there forward, that was our campaign and our project, was to get a base of workers ready to be able to organize to strike on Black Friday. And we did it, which was great. So we had about 500 workers strike on strike the week of Black Friday, joined by just a tremendous coalition of, um, of community of unions and community activists and volunteers who came out and supported. Um, oh, Oh, thanks. <laughs> I sort of forgot about the PowerPoint. So this is the group of organized uh, organizations that supported and participated in Black Friday, but there were also just this huge, huge network of individuals who also stepped forward. And people we used, um, if you see there, number four is the Corporate Action Network. This was this amazing program that, that, um, that is an organization that ran a, has a program on the internet where you could actually go in. Did any of you use it? Anyone here go to Corporate Action Network? Chris, so tell me, what did what you, what you do when you went there? What, what did it do for you? Okay, so, so if you, so if you, let's say that I lived in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I saw something on the news, and I said, wow, I really want to do this. I could go to Corporate Action Network, I could plug in my zip code, and I could find a list of actions at Walmarts that were happening. And if there was, an, there, and it would tell me if somebody was already organizing an action at that Walmart, and I could go to it, 
or it would tell me that there was a store that nobody was organizing an action at and I could take responsibility for organizing an action at that store. So we had individuals around the country who were able to get online, plug in, adopt a store that they were going to do, organize an action on, and then other people who in that area who, went, who wanted to participate in that action were able to then sign up and be on their list and have a time and date and show up. And just as an example, and you know, we had a, there was a worker or a community member in North Carolina who called us and said, who, who signed up and said, I want to put, to put on the store. And we tried to call people also, because you know, my view is technology is not a substitute for actual personal communication and organizing. So we called that person to say, great, we see that you volunteered to organize an action at the Walmart. And she said, well, I'm really scared. I don't know how to do this, but no one else was doing it. So I just, you know, I, I'll try. After the action, we did a debrief, and she said, you know, I'm really sorry. I'm just not sure we were totally on message. I tried really hard, but, you know, I was expecting 20 people who had RSVP'd, and 150 people showed up. And this happened around the country. We had, a, we had documented right now 1,192 store actions that happened around the country. And that doesn't, and we believe that there are many more who didn't get covered because there are just so many people were spontaneously joining. Um, and oh yeah, here we go, over a thousand. I mean, it was more than a thousand. That was our goal was a thousand. We exceeded it. And um, and there were about 75 WalMarts around the country where workers actually struck. And this includes, there were really three categories of places where workers struck. One was places that we had been working for a long time, right? And you know, in the back we have Anna um, and Mabel, who are two organizers from the Bay Area, who do this amazing work, amazing shout out to the two of them. But you know, they've been on the ground. Um, Anna is a UFCW member from the South Bay. She's been out for a year in our advanced member organizer program, really training Anna to be able to be you know, a full-time union organizer if that's what she wants to do. And so she's been working with these leaders and these stores for a long time. So that was one category of the strikes, places where we had real organizers, deeply engaged, building committees and moving people to strike. Then we had a second category, which is what we call our online to offline people. And an example of this is, so these are people who, there's never been an organizer in their area, ever. They've never had a house call from an organizer. But they found the organization online through Facebook and, um, and decided to come to, that they were interested and to be a part of it and started organizing in their store. So we have a network and we have a team now that is working with them both online but also calling them and if, and if they're serious and they can bring a group of workers together in their areas, we will fly an organizer out to sit down and meet with them and help them build it. So an example of this is in Oklahoma. Uh, there was a worker who, when we did our first strikes a month ago, his name's Jeff Landry, and he, um, he's a veteran, he's a student, he's a father, struggling, he found the organization online, said, this is what I want, I want to be a part of this. And so he just took a cardboard box, he painted a message on it about what he wanted Walmart from Walmart, better wages and health care, and went on, on strike and stood outside his store for 24 hours with the sign, the cardboard box sign that he had made. So we sent somebody out there to meet with him, uh, work, and the person was Angela Williamson. She was a, a, a leader at Walmart who had been fired for organizing and is now a full-time online, offline organizer who flies around to support people who are doing this kind of organizing. And she met with them so that then they were able to build and do a bigger strike um, on Black Friday. And then, the, so there was a whole category of places like that in Mississippi, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in Minneapolis, in Paducah, Kentucky, um, in uh, Clovis, New Mexico, these small towns that we would never be able to have the resources to put boots on the ground organizers in, 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 or know even where we would you know, find the people who really wanted to do it. And we were able to have real strikes of multiple workers in a store who stood up and participated, which was just amazing. And then the third category is people who literally saw the strike on Facebook and joined it in that moment on that day. We had a worker in, and these were people who we had never spoken to, never even heard of, who posted um, online and said, uh, you know, here's me, I'm with this woman in Ocean City, uh, uh, Marilyn, I can't even remember her name, I'm sorry, but she just took a picture of herself and posted it up on Facebook and said, I'm with you, I've joined the strike. 
and she never talked to an organizer. So it's just extraordinary how with this combination of, te of using technology together with on the ground organizing, connecting those two, the network that we were really able to build. So um, can you go back, I, I wasn't really following the PowerPoint, but I, I just wanted to paint that picture now, but I, I wanna just actually sort of make sure and you know, kind of go through. So can you just back up a little bit? So, all right, so we covered that. And, and just the other thing I would say is that, you know, this was not a majority strike strategy, right? This was not a strategy to try to shut down Walmart and make sure that nobody walked into the store. And this was a source of frustr some frustration for some people who participated in the actions who really wanted it to be about shutting it down, right? But that wasn't our purpose, right? Our purpose was to show Walmart and show the country that there are Walmart workers who, despite all of the fear, all of the threats, all of the retaliation, and all of the bullying that happens, that are still willing and able to stand up and talk and speak out and speak truth about what's really happening there. And, um, and we wanted to do it in a way that it was not just, oh, these are these crazy fringe people who, you know, who strike and yell and scream, but we wanted it to be that these people who had the courage to do it were heroes that were speaking the truth of every Walmart associate around the country. And that was our biggest accomplishment. Anna just told me a story uh, about Victoria, who's from the Fremont store, right? Who went back into her store and was terrified, right? How are her coworkers gonna respond, right? How is her manager gonna respond? Everybody went into the store and congratulated her and thanked her for having the courage to do this. And we heard this story, we heard this story around the country. You know, and I, I've been an organizer for 20 years, and you know, I was worried that we were going to be overpolarizing the, the, the source, right? That people were going to turn against those people who were strong and who, who participated. But instead of polarizing, it actually brought people closer to us, which was the purpose. Um, and people just report people hugging them, thanking them, crying um, about their courage. So it was really, it was just what was to me that was what was most the most extraordinary accomplishment of this whole whole experience. Um, and and I just want to say just a little bit more about the underlying structure here. You know, we are not trying to organize the union right now, right? Because you you know, going through the National Labor Relations Board, trying to win elections, doing it that that's not going to work for Walmart, right? We know what Walmart does, right? Meat cutters sign up, they eliminate the whole department. A store work in you know, a store in Canada, workers signed up and they voted in a union, the store closed down. Right? They will squash it at any one store, but they cannot squash this viral movement. Um, and there is no reason that we can't start acting like a union right, right now, which is what we're doing. And so we're saying we don't need to wait for majorities. Right? We don't need to have a vote. We can just be the organization that we want to have for Walmart workers. So from the very beginning, workers are paying $5 a month to be a member. Right? That money goes towards training and development, bringing people together, doing these trips and actions that we do. Um, we have eight markets with poor people, and everything else is our online program, which is really an online off program, which is really using Facebook um, and using social media to connect people around the country to the organization. Um, and, and again, we have a, a leadership body of about 100, I mean, there's probably about 250 now activists and leaders around the country who really take public leadership um, and leadership with others around the organization. Um, and just a little bit more about how our online works. Do you guys want to hear a little bit more about how this works? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, you know, there are multiple ways that people reach out to us. We have a 1-800 number, we have a text program, we have Facebook, we have email, we have, you know, there's just a million different ways that people reach out to us. And so, we, you know, a huge challenge is how do we intake all of that. So we've created a system that acts sort of like a funnel that captures all these different ways that people are coming into the organization um, and brings, um, brings them into us. Um, the first thing we do is really is figure out, is talk to them about their story and their experience, right? We found that, you know, the first thing that we do isn't just, okay, you're interested, let's go have a strike, let's go do a picket line, but it's really like, what's your story? And how do it connect their story to the story of others? Because people are very isolated in the workplace, right? I and mean, I think we all, in different industries, this is the same situation. And how do they see that their pain and their story is the same as the pain and the story of other Walmart associates? around the country. 
Um, and so we try to connect them to another R Walmart leader. So we have leaders who are online on Facebook, leaders who call people um, who are there to sort of establish that first point of connection with someone in the organization. Um, we also educate people about what it's going to take to organize and how they do that, and then talk to them about um, you know what what reaction they're going to have from Walmart inoculation um, that they're going to have. Um, then we also then we start to activate them. We try to connect them with other leaders and workers in their stores or in their areas. Um, so if we have somebody who comes forward from um, you know from a Sox City, Minneapolis, you know we'll connect him to the. You know, or the, the, we have a leader in Sauk City, Minneapolis. If somebody from Minneapolis, from Minnesota, if somebody from Minneapolis get, comes on Facebook, we say, hey, there's another leader who's just two hours north of you. Let's put you guys in touch so that you can start talking. So really connecting people as soon as possible um, to somebody else. Um, and then as people take and get more involved and take more leadership, it's really moving them into a position where they're leading and organizing um, and facilitating the engagement of others. Oh, and just go back, I'm sorry. And just the other thing is the, oh no, no we're gonna get to that. Sorry, 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 go ahead. Um, and Facebook is just, I cannot, I mean, I was a real skeptic about Facebook. You know, I have friends who were like, I can't believe, you know, you know, we allow, you know, if, you know, that, but anyway, I mean, there's a lot of criticisms of Facebook, right? But it is an extraordinary organizing tool. Um, we use both the main page, and this is just an example of, you know, somebody somewhere posts something up, and then, you know, and then there's a back and forth discussion. Uh, Mary Pat here is a leader somewhere, um, and so, you know, she's, you know, responding and helping, you know, engage that person. So it's just a, it, you know, we'll find sometimes we say, hey, does anybody, you know, anybody have a problem with, um, you know, with uh, anyone's schedules got reduced this week, right? Um, at the end of a month, for example. And then you'll have people around the country say, well, it's happening in Texas, in this city, it's happening, oh, you know, it's also happening in Boston, Massachusetts. And, you know, so people can, can you know, are able to connect and talk. But the other thing that we use, uh, which isn't up here, is we use these groups. Um, and have you guys, any of you guys use Facebook groups? Yeah, okay, so we now have these like regional groups set up that are private groups. I run a private group for all of the leaders nationally where we have a private conversation with everybody who's part of our formal leadership structure. So I'm able to get, you know, instant feedback on the campaign. I mean, there's a staff of about 60 people who work under me, but I can instantly find out, hey, did anybody hear about this memo from Walmart threatening people with their jobs if they strike on Black Friday? And I instantly can get 10, 15 comments from people. So it just, the, the, the way that it just allows us to really hear and have access to, I call it like a real-time focus group, right? That we don't have to do, you know, it's just instantly you can see what people are reacting to, what the issues are in the store. It just all surfaces up through these groups. Um, and uh, so we have 30 Facebook groups that are engaging hundreds of associates. Um, and then we have all together, our Facebook page has 19, almost 20,000 um, folks on it. And it's a vast majority of that are Walmart associates, some supporters, but we really try to have the supporters uh, part of the Making Change at Walmart Facebook page and community so that the Facebook page for our Walmart is really a worker to worker uh, page. So the next. Um, um, so, you know, there's also, in addition to the, to the Facebook, we, we do weekly conference calls with people because we just, again, find that you cannot substitute, um, you can't, technology doesn't substitute and online doesn't substitute for actual real discussions with people, both in person and on the phone. And so you have, you know, in our experience, it makes a huge difference to supplement the online stuff and you know it has to be hand in hand with actual real um, connection and engagement um, we also have um, a, a great website that people can see a whole range of different resources we have uh, we've built this uh, policy manual that's basically taken all of walmart's policies that they don't allow people to have actual physical copies of they only have them on this you know, it's just it's this labyrinthine type system. We've compiled it all. People can download parts of it on there. People can download materials. We had a strike toolkit that people could download so that anybody can go on this website and download and find resources um, and information. Um, and then we also have, um, you know, do a lot of emailing back and forth with people. We also have national tele-town halls where we, um, and robocalls where we reach out and call everybody to give them um, alerts about things and then bring them into conference calls. We've had a couple conference calls
calls with about 500 people from around the country. Um, it's a major way that people, you know, people are able to hear other leaders talking about what they're doing, and then so they might be in a small town in Mississippi, but they're able to hear and connect um, actually like on the phone with people um, in other areas. And then, um, and then we also have a great texting system where we have, um, I think now like 600 texts, texts things is we're able to send sort of text alerts and do text polling and you know and get again real instant you know i was able during the strike to you know send out you know text us your store number and where you're on strike and then get back so that we were it was one of the ways we were able to track people who were joining the strike who weren't sort of part of the actual or, uh, sort of um, more organized infrastructure um, so the other thing is, is just the importance of actually uh, bringing people together. And again, you know, I just, I know I keep saying this, but, you know, technology isn't a substitute in our view to the actual in-person connection. We've been running a series of online leader summits where we take leaders who have started to get involved on Facebook and actually bring them together in person to talk. Um, this was a meeting that we had at the Highlander Center um, in uh, Tennessee, which was, you know, just a profound experience um, to be there with that kind of history that was there and bring this group of Walmart workers who are around the country. Again, you know, we've got in this group, we've got Arkansas represented, uh, rural Illinois, uh, Louisiana, uh, Fort Worth, Texas, um, uh, Kentucky, um, Minnesota, you know, just again from around the country um, into these meetings. And what we really found is that, you know, pretty much everybody in this group, when this was a meeting that we had in, I think, um, August, um, they all struck. Right? Because they connected to each other, they made a commitment to each other. And then even when Walmart was coming down on people, threatening people that they were going to be fired, they had to, they had built this community and this connection that was a foundation for them to be strong enough to follow through and take the action. So the, the three key key takeaways I would say is that you know one is quality over quantity, right? Like the foundation of scaling something is doing it really, you know, really, really well with the with the core group of people to be in a position to then be able to do it um, much bigger and that we really needed to, you know, we're building our system and you know eventually we want to have you know hundreds of thousands of people who are involved. Uh, but it's going to take, you know, sort of steps to get there. Um, the second is is this importance of forming a community of care online for isolated associates. And this means that, you know, we can't just take people from zero to 60, right? Like people need to feel supported and connected and making and having that space online be a place where we can do it. I often call the, uh, the Facebook page that we have sort of like an online water cooler, right? Like somebody who needs support talks to another coworker um, and, you know, is able to feel that support and, and connection there and really doing that in a really systematic way. And then the, you know, the other key thing is staying small to stay big, right? Like having these smaller groups, these places where people you know, can both see and be a part of this big national thing, but also engage in a smaller way that's meaningful, that allows for them to really have personal um, connection um, and commitments to each other. And I think that's it. Is there more? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I just, I just, I'm going to tell you two stories of two workers, and this is, these two are at, Net, uh, at Roots Camp right now, which is this big national um, camp for activists and organizers who do a lot of online stuff as well in Washington, D.C., so that, that's why they're particularly on here, but just to give you some real concrete examples, uh, do we have time for this? Okay, so this is Angela Williamson, and, you know, there are many wonderful leaders in this organization. Angela just has, has something really, really special. She was, um, she found the organization online. She lived in, um, I think it was Pentecostal, Florida, was where she worked, um, and she started getting involved. Um, she had been at Walmart for four years, um, and so she found the organization, realized that the problems she was facing were not hers alone. They were problems that associates around the country were facing. Um, and she got involved, um, and then right after she got involved, Walmart fired her uh, because she had too many absences. Now, so first of all, she was obviously fired for organizing. Um, second of all, um, she was, um, you know, but the concrete reason was that she put in the hospital with a kidney infection. And this is just to give you a sense of what Walmart is like. But what's extraordinary about Angela is 
you know, is that she, she just bounced right back. And she, instead of getting defeated, and, and you know, she ended up losing her apartment, you know, her son um, had, or her daughter had to go um, live with her father, not with her for a while, because she couldn't, you know, she, yeah, she had to relocate back to her parents' house. And, um, but she just said, you know, I want to fight. I want to do this. We have a program where we pay lost wages for up to two months of any associate who loses their job as a result of organizing. And she just, she just did that, took it, started traveling all around the country, organizing people, getting more involved. She led a strike in, uh, she went back to Central Florida for the strike and led strikers in five stores in Central Florida um, on Black Friday. And so she's just been really um, exceptional. And then, um, and that's her actually doing, that's an old coworker of hers who was uh, elderly, had very poor health, doctor's notes saying that he had to, he couldn't stand every day at work. They wouldn't give him a chair. Angela took a chair, sat down, and said, I'm not leaving this Walmart store until they give this guy a chair, and they gave her a chair. So she's just, you know, amazing. Just, you know, there's just so many people like Angela, you know, who are out there in this workforce. Um, and then this is um, this is another uh, woman, Kate Searcy, and um, she's a she's a great story. She um, she was a Republican. She was lived in rural Arkansas, and uh, when she saw the uh, remember the forty seven what was it the forty seven percent you know she went ballistic. She ended up doing a video like thing about it, talking about how you know she'd been a Republican her whole life, and when she heard that, and she you know said. If anybody, um, you know, is you know is dependent on government, it's Walmart, not me. I work hard. You know, I don't want this, right? Like I'm in this situation because Walmart doesn't do what they need to do. Um, and she is now a national spokesperson, and she's you know involved, and she um, she was fired unjustly. Um, but the great news is, is that she's now working at a union grocery store and is continuing to be a, a active uh, union member. And then this, um, this is four workers in Paducah, Kentucky. Has anyone here heard of Paducah, Kentucky? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Great. All right. But it's, you know, it's not a place you would imagine that there would be, you know, you know, it's not the first place you'd think of that there would be this kind of worker activity, but this is a group of strikers. Um, again, you know, the strike was about against retaliation. It's an unfair labor practice strike. So all together now we have members in 43 states. We have 20,000 likes. Um, and we are making you know, improvements every day at the work site, and so it's just, yeah, I think that's it. And I'm told I have three minutes, and now I'm done, but I am happy to take questions if you want. So. Yes? Uh, my name's Mike Daly, I'm an iron worker. Walmart materials come to this country on ships run by maritime union trades. They arrive in our continent where they're handled by unionized dock workers. All of them need support, but they can support you as well. Uh, the Walmart facilities are built in North America by non-union contractors. Building trades people are very uh, anxious to stop that and work with you. So somehow at this conference, we have people right in this room who you can network with to expand and build this. We have had historically a Taft-Hartley restriction on secondary boycotts, but Taft-Hartley cannot stop the power of electronic media. That's why we're here today to learn how to win. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. And I just, I want to just make a note on this that I, you know, I didn't talk about this um, and perhaps I should have, but this, our Walmart is one piece of the campaign, but we believe that this is, you know, there, you cannot address Walmart without addressing the whole supply and distribution chain. And really the solution is engaging at every level. And we have current active uh, alliances and, and that we're working closely with um, a group called the National Guest Worker Alliance that organizes um, a, folks who work in contracted, um, that are guest workers who work in the United States for companies that produce products and food for, for U.S. retailers. Walmart is a major contractor for those. Um, they recently had a strike of shrimp workers in the Gulf of Mexico, um, and also with the warehouse workers who are also contracted, who do the taking things out of the, um, the I mean, after they come from the ports, 
they unload them in Walmart contra controlled warehouses and then send them to the stores. And we really believe that you know, we need a whole plan that engages at every single level um, and, and brings it all together. And you know, we do believe that you know, Walmart matters not just because there's a group of 1.4 million associates who are not being treated right. It matters because it shapes the entire economy and we absolutely need to, you know, there's many, many groups that have stakes in what Walmart's happened and our view is the more people who want to come and be a part of making this change, the stronger we're going to all be together. Yes? So why do you think this is happening now? Why do you think this historical moment was right? I saw Robert Greenwald's uh, film about Walmart years ago, maybe it came out in 2005 or earlier, and there was a, an organizing component to that film as well, but uh, it's only now. So what, can you give me some? I'll give you a very simple answer for that, which is that the past campaigns had a worker component, and this campaign is worker-led. And the, you know, there has been a strategic decision on the part of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union to not have the, you know, to have the, the worker organization of our Walmart be a lead component, the lead component of the whole campaign, and has invested in a way that was far, far different from you know, previous investments in the worker organizing before. And it's, you know, it's just, it can only happen if you, you know, really put time and energy and resources and have a strategic commitment for that to be the part of it. In the past, the strategy was principally to block Walmart from expanding into core markets and, um, and to really expose them publicly you know, for what they are. And there was a piece that involved the workers, but this strategy is just the complete opposite, right? Or, the, or not the opposite, it's the reverse, right? Which which is to build a base of leaders, activate them, build a membership base, get people into action, and then you know raise the, and through that movement raise the issues about how what workplace conditions are like and what the impact is of Walmart overall. So it was really a strategic decision and a resource question. Yeah. I'm Bob Dagman. I, I belong to a number of uh, retiree organizations, mm -hmm. including uh, Car California Alliance for Retired Americans, which by the way has over 900,000 members. And I was involved in one of those things where they went to state assembly and state senators' offices. They covered about 120 out of 122 places, not Sacramento, but where they where they actually come from. Mm -hmm. That's the power of CAR, and they work with unions on a number of issues in that, including I think phone banking and you name it. So I think to get together with them, even though they're retired, most of them are Walmart employees. Still, a lot of our union employees and they're non-union too. Everybody's welcome if they're if we have a common goal. A lot of union people seem to think, think that if you're not union, well, you're un American. But you're as American as Apple Pie, whether or not you are union. So I like to see more about this, you know, like working Walmart, working with uh, Car and other groups. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'd like to have some, say somebody from you like speak to retirees that because I'm a member and I can probably get you in to speak uh, in front of some of these groups. So I'd love to see that. Also, I don't think we should be so dependent on Democrats anymore. I'm beginning to. I, I don't trust many Democrats. I don't care what the Labor Council says. They, 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 they've let us down tremendously, and we keep putting hundreds of millions of dollars behind. But we don't, it's like the uh, Democrats feel that we don't have a choice because it's either the Republicans or us. And that, that, what's the sense of having the lesser of two evil when you have the evil of two lessers? So that's, the, and also one last thing, uh, I, I support unionization for Walmart, but I'm also, don't forget the public union, because I retired after 36 years from the post office. And they're being, they're literally trying to have these people in Congress, and many of them are trying to hand, hand the post office head on the platter. And I think it's time that we start supporting the post office because they're going to destroy the public unions as well, which is the strength of unions. So, anyway, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I, again, I think what's powerful about this message, and the other reason, going back to your point about why is this feeling different, is that. You know, the issues, you know, Walmart workers aren't just raising these issues because it's for Walmart workers, but, you know, Walmart is the biggest corporation in the country, and, you know, and the issues that, that their workers are facing are the same ones everyone's are facing, and so we, you know, we, you know, people really, the goal here is that we're raising these issues and trying to create a moment here where we can talk about all of it um, across the country in every different sector. And let's go after corporate media, too, big time. Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're okay. going to have to go to our next speaker. Okay. But I want to thank you very much for this important presentation. Now uh, we're going to go to Richard Stallman in Brazil, and we'll look that up. And I think. Uh,
this is quite an interesting discussion that we're going to have.